by her third beer, she was thinking about what it would be like to have sex with Robert. Probably it would be like that bad kiss, clumsy and excessive, but imagining how excited he would be, how hungry and eager to impress her, she felt a twinge of desire pluck at her belly as distinct and painful as the snap of an elastic band against her skin. You just heard from the author of the viral literary phenomenon of the past few years. Cat Person is the most widely read piece of fiction on the New Yorker's website ever, with 4.5 million views. Kristen Rupenian's wildly successful piece went on to feature in her collection of short stories, You Know You Want This, soon to appear in a French translation. She joins us in the studio to tell us more. Kristen, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks so much for having me. Well, given that this is your first book and that short stories aren't necessarily a best-selling genre, it's quite a bold declaration, you know you want this. Is that directed at us, the readers? Do you stand by it? I, I do stand by it, although it's funny. I, the collection had that title before Cat Person went viral, before any of this happened. Um, it's a line from the first story in the book, but when I was putting all the stories together, I realized there was sort of a moment in each story where one character might be able to say it to another where it would have fit and that was when I thought okay there's a theme here that's running through all the stories tying them together this theme of sort of conflicted or contested desire and so once cat person went viral and all of that happened there was the second layer that did seem a little more ironic than I had originally intended but I still think it works the public certainly did want it <laughs> now the collection was snapped up by publishers after as you said the, the story went viral in December 27 after yeah. publication in the New Yorker and you were given a seven figure advance for that and I think at the time you were still doing postgraduate work not mm -hmm. exactly living the literary superstar <laughs> lifestyle yeah. how did it change your life I mean both in every way and surprisingly little. Um, I It was huge to me. I mean, I can't say anything else other than, yeah, for, for years I had been sort of trying to um, scrabble together enough money to keep writing, spending that time, pay my rent, and to have an amount of money land on my lap that meant that I could keep on writing for the foreseeable future was huge. Um, but at the same time, before Cat Person went viral, I spent every morning on my couch, you know, trying to write, doing my best. And then afterwards, it was exactly the same thing. Um, the book coming out and talking about it publicly and, and sort of trying to explain what I think about it, that is actually very new. That feels funny to me, the idea that not only do I write the story, but I have to talk about it in public. I still feel like I'm wrapping my head around. Um, but yeah, it was, an, it was an amazing thing to happen. Okay. Well, before we discuss some of the themes covered in that story, Cat Person, I've been curious about the title since I read it, I must admit. Are you trying to suggest that someone who is a cat person <laughs> is trustworthy, that there's something we can take as proof of their good character? No, de definitely not. It's not a claim about cat people in general. I think the idea for the title came from something I do think is really common and that we all do, which is when we're getting to know someone, especially if we're meeting them online without a lot of context, we're so hungry for information about what kind of person they might be like that we'll take things like, do they like cats or dogs, and try and read into them so much more. So yeah, he likes cats, that must mean he's introverted and likes to stay at home and is warm <laughs> and affectionate. And like that could be true, but it doesn't directly follow from someone saying they're a cat person. But I think we could, it's easy to lose track of that when you don't have any other way of assessing what kind of a person someone might be. Okay, I have to ask you, are you a cat person or a dog person? I am neither. I like both. Um, but I do have a cat right now. So oh, yes, okay. I think that says a lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, cat person has been held up as a kind of perfect portrait of the 21st century dating scene. And a lot of people identified with the female protagonist, Margot mm -hmm. especially. And there as in many of your short stories, we see you explore this power dynamic between men and women and also the idea of consent, just about how and when someone says no to a sexual encounter when they feel uncomfortable. What did you want to say about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I never start out writing a story with an idea that I have something to say. It's usually I'm, I'm figuring it out as I write and it's often sort of after the story is written and even out in the world that I start to see um, sort of if there's an argument underneath. I think it's important when we talk about cat person in sort of conversations about consent to, to be clear that I think the, um, the encounter is consensual, right? Um, Margot is often the one actively moving it forward. There's never a point where she even equivocates. The question is, 
at some point, she doesn't want to do it anymore. She would like to back out, and she feels like that she can't. And then the story spends some time, I think, trying to understand why. Um, and, and I do think there are a lot of possible explanations and reasons and the sort of larger context of what it means to be in a young, be a young woman in the world, like influences that. And yet I do think there's a lot of, of ambiguity and uncertainty. I think Margot herself doesn't quite know why she makes the choices she makes, which is part of the reason that um, the experience and then reading the story can feel so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of dating, Margot and Robert don't happen to meet online, but online dating does come up in You Know You Want This in a way that makes it feel very contemporary. Indeed, the digital world has almost irreversibly changed the way people relate to each other, especially in romantic relationships. Well, for more on how that's affected our behaviour, we spoke to the founder of Happen, a dating app invented here in France that uses geolocalization technology to match potential partners based on their whereabouts. Didier Rappaport gave us an insight into male and female approaches to getting a date. For example, in Brazil, women are more proactive than in other countries in that, on Happen, they often make the first move, they send the first message, or they send a request as opposed to waiting for the man. And when you go to Brazil, you notice that people, or women, are more open to other people. As for men, they behave the same way in all countries. And that could be linked to this image that we have of men's so-called roles in society, which has been perpetuated for centuries. So Didier Rappaport there says that male behaviour in the virtual world is like male behaviour in the real world. And men actually had a lot of, to say about the success of Cat Person. There was even a parody yeah. account called Men Respond to Cat Person. That was a Twitter right. account that was satirised how men felt about it. What did you think of the male genuine response to the story? Yeah, it's funny sort of heartbreakingly men react to cat person was not satire all that account did was retreat actual responses <laughs> from men they just were so occasionally ridiculous it felt like satire um i mean i think that the there was a lot of discomfort in the male response and, and to a certain degree i think that's reasonable right it's a very uncomfortable story i think the idea that you might have been on a date with someone and they were thinking the kinds of things and having the kinds of feelings that margo was having that is really upsetting. I think what was sort of troubling about the response was how, like, immediately it became Margot's problem. Do you know what I mean? That the men were, that not, the men who read the story and re reacted poorly to it, their immediate instinct, or like the reaction was anger, or why didn't she tell me? How could she be feeling this? What are we supposed to do if people won't tell us immediately what they're thinking? And I feel like what is just true is that when you're getting to know someone, you don't know what they're thinking. You don't know how they're feeling or if what they're saying matches what's going on inside. And like being comfortable with that level of, of ambiguity is sort of necessary to move in the world. And so, so I do feel like it's okay to have an initial kind of, you know, just uncomfortable response. But the question of what you do with that, those feelings, I think, I don't know, it wasn't a very positive <laughs> reflection of sort of where we are right now in terms of the way that a lot of people responded. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the different perspectives between men and women on relationships, at the recent Hay Literary Festival uh. in the UK, a professor of behavioural science said that studies found that unmarried, childless women live happier, healthier uh -huh. lives. And that was met with a lot of criticism, <laughs> even though it was a, based on scientific yeah. research. People could not believe right. that uh, this was part of some kind of anti-men discussion course. Uh -huh. Why do you think it was so difficult to believe? Yeah, I mean, I think it does push against the stories that we're told a lot, especially as sort of young women, as women in their 20s in particular, often feel, I think, this kind of pressure to move forward into the future, move in, getting married, having a house, having children. Um, and there isn't a lot of talk of what about what the drawbacks are. It's almost like lock it down, get married, and then figure out like whether you actually want to be there or not. And I think, I mean, again, yeah, it, that shouldn't be true, right? We don't want, no one wants marriage to equate to unhappiness for women. But I do think a little bit more care in terms of thinking about like, what are the trade-offs? Where are we right now? If, you know, housework isn't equally being shared, if having children, um, you know, really, you know, 
lessens your earning power when that's something that's important to you, those are things you should be considering, like while you're trying to date and when you're thinking about getting married, rather than, as I think it sometimes can be now, be like, oh, well, I'm sure that will solve it when we get to it. <laughs> okay, well, sadly, we're going to have to wrap up this show. But before we do, we asked you for a cultural tip and you recommended Booksmart, the new film from Olivia Wilde. Why did that strike a chord with you? Yeah, well, um, you know, truly being on Book Tour, you don't get to see a lot of movies in the theater. And so it was this really delightful moment moment just a week or so ago when I kind of happened into the theater and saw it and it's just it's a it's a um I think it stars Jonah Hill's sister as a kind of like gender flipped uh uh super bad and I just found the two main characters hilarious and very relatable in that in the sense that they are people who have sort of done everything right throughout high school and then get to the end of it and are like, maybe I missed the point. Maybe the point of high school wasn't just to achieve, achieve, achieve. And as, as a sort of overachiever in recovery, I really identified with that. Um, that sense of like, wait a second, how did I get here? Why have I been spending my time? the way that, that I have. And then it's just really, really funny. Oh, good advice for yeah. us all. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> Kristen, thanks so much for joining us today. And we'll leave you with a clip from Booksmart, which is on general release here in France as well. Remember to check out our website and you can also keep up with France 24 on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. Nobody knows that we are fun. We didn't party because we wanted to focus on school and get into good colleges. And it worked. But the irresponsible people who partied also got into those colleges. We haven't done anything. We haven't broken any rules. Name one person whose life was so much better because they broke a couple of rules. Picasso. He broke art rules. Rosa Parks. Name another Susan one. Susan B. Anthony. God damn it. Dicks, put me to your lips. Hand sanitizer. Chapstick. Chapstick. Mace. Listen, it is very important that you keep the safety. Oh!